so let us start our session. So thank you so much for uh, your uh, kind uh, participation in this uh, online research meeting. Um, let me just uh, share with you a little bit of a uh, background with you, and then uh, we're going to start. All right, so please take your seat. Okay, we are going to, you know, sit apart from each other. <laughs> so uh, you hear me okay, right? <laughs> I can hear you well, yes. yes. Thank you very much. So let me just uh, share the file, and then, uh, okay, I would like to... Uh, Okay, talk to you, okay, about the background of uh, this research. Okay, so uh, here it is. So can you see the first page, right? No, you cannot. Oh, you cannot. Uh, what about uh, Dr. Moshama, are you? I cannot. You cannot, okay. Okay, when, once again, I would like... I usually to... don't use Zoom, though, maybe. Ah, okay, then, uh, right. Okay, I, I'm going to share this once again. Then, uh, the first slide. Okay, how is it now? Now I can see it. Now you can see it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, right, so we're going to start our session. Thank you very much. So this is a, a re online research meeting. And then the title of this research meeting is With our Regional Integrations, Comparison of ASEAN and EU from Philosophical and Political Economic Perspectives. So uh, we are uh, an ad hoc group of you know, political scientists, uh, philosophers, and then an economist, right? So uh, we are kind of like a hodgepodge of, you know, uh, humanity to social sciences. So uh, that's why we need uh, various kinds of, you know, uh, open-minded uh, collaboration. Otherwise, you know, our uh, conclusion might also be hodgepodge. <laughs> so, so let us uh, collaborate with each other. Okay, so uh, this is about the, okay, regional uh, integration thing. Uh, oh, sorry, let me just uh, return back to the uh, first page. All right. So this one, uh, philosophical and political economic perspectives. So these two uh, perspectives uh, will be applied in this research meeting. So let me move on to the next page. Outline and objective of the, the online research meeting. So uh, taking the cases of ASEAN and EU as representative regional integrations, we at Chiba University wish to invite uh, Mahidon University International College researchers and discuss various uh, positive as well as negative factors affecting these uh, regional integrations of ASEAN, you know, Association of Southeast Asian Nations and EU or uh, European Union. So I'm sure uh, both of you are really uh, familiar with uh, these two regional integrations in your own uh, ways, right? Because uh, uh, some of you, I mean, one of you is actually a political scientist, okay? And then uh, the other uh, person I mean, <laughs> is actually a, a philosopher. So uh, we uh, have to uh, set a common language, of course, they, very basic common language. So, uh, okay, the rivalry, the second bullet point, the rivalry among globalism, regionalism, and nationalism, the impact of COVID-19, distributive justice and bioethical concept, human and uh, disease mobility will be uh, discussed. But uh, these are at the speaker's uh, own choice. So please do not worry about, uh, oh, should I you know, include this you know, point in my presentation? Please do not worry about it. As your mind you know, dictates you, please just uh, open, your, I mean, uh, open up your, your uh, case about uh, what you think about you know, the, the comparison of ASEAN and EU. But these are some examples. So, uh, and then uh, the purpose, the whole purpose is to consider justice in any sense as perceived by the speakers in connection to regional integrations. I hope uh, these points are being clear. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. And then the, the outline and the online meeting is organized under the research project Shiba Studies on Global Fair Society, a multidisciplinary approach. And this is led by our uh, professor uh, Jiro Mizushima, uh, whom you met uh, just now. So uh, move on to the next point. What is regional integration? Okay, according to an uh, uh, EU related online material, regional integration is the process by which two or more nation states agree to cooperate and work closely together to achieve peace, stability, and wealth. So uh, this cooperation usually begins with economic integration and as it continues, comes to include political uh, integration. Economic integration is the process by which uh, different countries agree to remove trade barriers between them. Then uh, trade barriers can be tariffs, uh, which is uh, taxes imposed on imports to a country. Quotas, which is a limit to the amount of a product that can be imported and border restrictions. Political integration, on the other hand, well, as the economy of the, the cooperating countries become completely integrated into a single market, there appears a need for common policies in society, uh, social policy, like education, healthcare, unemployment benefits and, and pensions, and uh, common pol political uh, institutions. This is political integration and it's the culmination occurs when the, the uh, cooperating uh, countries are so integrated that they share the same foreign policy that merge the, uh, their uh, armies even. In effect, they form a new country. But uh, I, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, EU or uh, uh, ASEAN, uh, you know, is at that stage. So uh, let us discuss freely about, you know, what we think, what you think about, you know, economic integration, uh, political integration, and then current very hot topics about uh, uh, either EU or ASEAN. So it's a very uh, much a comprehensive type of, uh, I mean, uh, issue area that we are gonna have to uh, cover, but please do not worry once again. Uh, please express yourself and then that's enough for us. <laughs> okay, uh, just one thing uh, about the philosophy of regional integration and then I wish to pass on to you. <laughs> so uh, peace, stability and wealth are all positive philosophical values. For peace and stability, uh, I mean these two uh, uh, lie in the realm of uh, political considerations. The balance between unity and diversity becomes an important issue. And uh, the philosophical concept of identity also seems to be relevant here. And for uh, wealth as an economic uh, consideration, a large scale or a large single market, that's always better than a small uh, market. So that's why regional integration takes place. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, okay, uh, with these, uh, I mean, introductory remarks, can I already uh, invite Dr. Gerald Moshamar to kindly uh, share your uh, perspectives on these uh, issues? Very wide-ranging issue, but please just uh, express. I mean, confine your discussion to your own area and then discuss freely. <laughs> Would that be uh, all right? Yes. Of Thank you course. so much. Okay, so the floor is yours. Please, you have about uh, 25, 30 minutes, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. My screen. I see, I see your okay, PowerPoint file. Okay, excellent. I'm trying to... Uh, so now it should be fine, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, if you can start... Okay, good. Uh, yeah, open the session. Okay. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you first very much for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, thank you for, uh, thanks go to Professor Ishido, right, uh, Professor Mishushima and uh, you Dr. Kawase for uh, making this possible. Uh, so really um, appreciate uh, that this cooperation uh, started and now can continue. Uh, it's uh, really excellent. Now I have to say uh, that I'm probably the one who is uh, the least uh, uh, experienced with uh, the, the particular field we are discussing here. So it's quite a challenge for me to uh, address this topic. Um, so um, as it is a challenge, my title is pretty uh, general. 
namely uh, integration of what and justice for whom. Uh, and its uh, subtitle is Methodological Considerations uh, Regarding ASEAN and uh, the EU. So um, being a philosopher, you know, methodology is interesting. Uh, so I am a little bit uh, also addressing this particular um, area. So uh, the natural sciences have an interesting relationship to the social sciences. Uh, the natural sciences give a kind of uh, a leadership and uh, many other sciences would like to become like natural sciences. The problem with the social sciences is of course uh, that that's uh, not uh, really fully possible, I think. And one reason is because uh, the normative and the descriptive uh, interplay somehow when we discuss uh, issues uh, that relate to uh, social affairs. So uh, indeed, it is not only uh, that uh, policies and um, uh, prescriptions should rely on, I would say, data. It often happens that actually the way we model the world, the social world, is uh, influenced by ideologies and so forth. Uh, and especially, of course, when we go to concrete uh, um, policy making, when we uh, go into areas like international relations, diplomacy, and so on, it's very difficult to make this distinction between academic discourse as a such and uh, actually really mm, yeah, doing politics at the end. Um, so uh, that reminds us also that um, the um, that societies and, and, and uh, the study of societies um, relates to something that is constructed. We construct society, institutions are made by us and um, also um, you know, um, any kind of, 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 of um, social phenomenon like money and so on uh, requires a set of rules and so forth. So in that sense, um, we uh, have a quite a different situation than studying the natural world. I think that's what I wanted to say first. Uh, now, we could also uh, be a bit more uh, detailed here. The point is somehow when we move from one state of a social world to another state, so basically when we just change society, we can do this sometimes quite successfully based on false models as well. False models work as good as right or correct models simply because uh, models can lead to uh, our understanding of the world basically can lead to prescriptions and prescriptions lead to actions and actions might change the world, the social world. So having said that, sometimes I think um, we are maybe a little bit misled by uh, uh, illusory predictability. We would like to predict in economics, in social science, like we do in the natural sciences. And not always uh, is that so clear cut. I give you a very simple example. Um, the whole idea of supply and demand, which is a standard in um, economic theory but um, is still under discussion when we take into account the viewpoint of the Austrian School of Economics. They do not believe that you can just uh, uh, construct supply and demand as mutually determining, as it's written here in this text I, I show you. Um, so uh, that just gives you a kind of an, an, an idea that uh, even such basic things are still debated in economic theory, whether we can precisely model uh, supply and demand. Um, and um, of course, we always chase the scientific model, but uh, again, the normative um, always um, comes back. And there's another issue which I would address later. So I'm sorry, this one. Um, so another um, important idea, I think, is that uh, a false model can change um, society in a way that it becomes actually better in describing that society. Um, this is a bit of a complex topic, I don't want to go too much into it, but it could be related to the free will issue, it could be related to, I think, gender studies in an interesting way, where uh, we pick up a certain description of reality and then try to transform society and actually um, produce a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense. But to be more uh, modest, it is simply true that many prescriptions in the social context, the political context, I believe, are rationalized through science, but um, the, the science itself is not really actually clear cut. So whenever you hear discussions about free market versus uh, more you know, social uh, engineering, 
or so on, uh, you, you, you can somehow feel that uh, always uh, people rely on data, rely on models, but it's not always successful. Uh, I mean, they are might be successful to convince you, but they're not successful in really um, truthfully capture social reality. So what is behind all that? That's the question. So arguing here just uh, for the sake of getting a clear contour, arguing uh, from the perspective of kind of the Austrian school of economics, and it's really only to get a perspective, I'm not saying I, I personally would support that, that viewpoint. Um, I would say it's interesting that that proposal says economics is actually applied logic and not empirical, which is an incredible statement. But it's a very powerful statement. Uh, the great names Mises and Hayek, these great economists, of course, came up with these um, uh, ideas, or a bit better, uh, they, they um, shaped these ideas up in the 19th century. Uh, so when we think about that, uh, human action is in the center of interest here. And human actions, since Aristotle, we know that very well in the West, um, is somehow uh, uh, has two logical components, means and ends. And um, the whole departure point for economics is the gap between those two. That's the whole point, the gap between means and ends. And um, what is this gap? It means basically our desires cannot be immediately fulfilled. So economic action must somehow fit in. And our means and desires are subjective. Our means and desires somehow have to uh, consider price and we have to think whether we want to enter free exchange. We have to think whether we want to actually pay the price for something that could um, meet our desires. What is now important in all this is the issue of information. Do we as individuals have enough information to make an ultimate rational choice? And does the theorist have enough information to model society? And the Austrian school would say no. That's why they are so into the free market. They say the only way we can uh, actually uh, get to any reasonable outcome is to let agents freely play because no one knows everything about all agents. So it has to be a system dynamics that cannot be predicted, that cannot be fully modeled, and we will never find laws of that system dynamics. That's, I think, an important point. Now, having said uh, that, uh, this kind of stipulation of a, 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 a subject, an economic subject that tries to improve his or her life, uh, and it should uh, be allowed uh, as, as much as possible to do so. Um, it is, I think, important to see that in modernity, we have um, somehow, a, of course, a promotion of that model of subjective preference, of self-interest, of uh, subjective utility. That's definitely an, one heritage of the Euro European Enlightenment. But equally, we have developed, of course, certain uh, common standards that ethical standards, norms, and related standards that I would uh, say most people just would uh, adhere to, would agree with. And when I say human rights, I don't think everyone agrees with human rights, but something like the uh, Millennium Development Goals by the UN, I think everyone would basically agree upon those goals. And there is a common core, I think, uh, that is quite promising of basic uh, improvement of human standards that all of us agree with, whether we are conservative, liberal, whether we are rich or poor. Normally, no one, I think, can argue against uh, re a reduction of child mortality, which has very successfully been uh, um, implemented in the last decades. So similarly, we have actually, strangely, a kind of a globalized consumer lifestyle developed that is, of course, still diverse, but nevertheless, there is a kind of a global common denominator, it seems. More interestingly, though, is, is an, the emergence of uh, new norms that are super uh, individual. They go beyond the individual. So we have uh, norms that uh, relate to environmental protection, of course, where we realize we have to cooperate. We have, of course, uh, the whole idea of social justice and fairness that is emerging, and it's a politically hot topic. 
And of course, we have the a cultural religious pushback in certain areas. When we think about Trumpism, when we think about the European discussion on Islam, these are all movements where suddenly uh, these kind of deep values, these kind of social values uh, come back. So now when we think about the whole idea of cooperation and fairness, I would say we can have here four principles that are important. One is the good old kind of paradox of freedom that if we all just do what we want to, we will step on each other's feet. So we have to somehow organize our society that we can live together. But that's a principle of reciprocity. And even if you are a libertarian, you will still accept that, I guess. You will not say, okay, you limit my freedom too much if uh, you don't allow me to play very loud music in two o'clock in the morning in my condominium. You uh, will definitely um, accept that because you don't want to listen to the music uh, at two o'clock probably in the morning from your neighbor. So that's an easy, simple um, example. Then the externalities question, I think still um, free marketeer, uh, a libertarian will accept, namely uh, that um, uh, when, you, when you impose some costs on society with your economic or individual operations, you should pay for these costs. The public should not absorb your costs. That is, of course, not really done that well in uh, modern forms of capitalism, but I think in principle, uh, most uh, reasonable people would agree. Here, of course, we have the problem of lobbying, right? Lobbies trying to uh, somehow get uh, env environmental standards low and so forth. And by the way, in the first example, I think we have the issue of manners because manners traditionally allow uh, people to somehow coexist well. And with uh, globalism, we actually have a, a loss of manners, I would say, and that's actually a problem. You just need to see what's going on in an international airport, right? It's not a, a role model of human coexistence. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, that's uh, still, I think the left side of the slide is showing us something that most uh, people would agree upon whether left or right, libertarian or, so, or so, more social, socialist or whatever. The right side of the slide is a, a kind of a different issue. Namely, the, it's about the whole compensation idea that some people have just uh, bad luck and we need to help them to be simple. So it's some people lose the natural or social lottery. And the question is, should we actively compensate them for having lost this lottery? And of course, that can go so far that we have to take from some who have something and give it to some who don't have it. And that's, of course, a problem. Not everyone will agree. Um, and a specific case of this issue is, of course, uh, historical unfairness, uh, where you could say is the people are only be better off, a certain group of people, because they historically caused another group of people to be worse off. And now they should actually uh, repair that situation. That is an, uh, another component of that problem. Of course, having said that, we do not need to think uh, about the right side in terms of only give, taking away and giving to someone. We could, of course, uh, think that uh, through cooperation, we can uh, increase the pool of opportunities, we can uh, increase productivity, and therefore we can actually uh, enhance uh, uh, human life without uh, taking from individuals too much and so it might be more acceptable but uh this is so the basic um framework here i want uh, first to, to stipulate and when we now move uh, i'm not i'm not sure where i'm uh, on the time what time is it now how long, how long have i spoken this is still fine okay um there is a second part namely this one so when you look uh, here uh, into uh europe we, of course, see uh, um, this kind of uh, movement that um, is kind of guided by improving your life, namely the West-East and North-South divide in Europe, both uh, within Europe and also uh, out of Europe, especially uh, um, labor migration and so forth from, west, uh, uh, from East to West, right? And the Brexit, of course, has, uh, is an interesting example of a stop to that to a certain point because many 
uh, Eastern Europeans have, of course, uh, uh, entered the UK to find work uh, because of language also and other reasons. Uh, and of course, also from uh, especially North um, Africa and the Middle East and so forth. So we have that kind of situation first. We have the migration issue. We have the uh, security issue, simply that uh, um, the NATO basically is now knocking on the door of Russia, which is a problem in international relations, I would say. I mean, Russia is definitely feeling threatened in a, in a sense. I mean, I'm not uh, excusing what they do, but uh, it's not my point anyway. But it's just like uh, there were shifts, shifts uh, that we can observe. Uh, uh, also, the, the most important part, maybe, I find, is the euro. You have a common uh, market, as you say, and a common currency. And currency is maybe the most important topic, I find, in global affairs nowadays. I find there's nothing more important than fiat currencies in global affairs. Nothing is more important than, co than, than currencies. I think the fiat currencies will define the future of this planet. That's my personal opinion. But uh, that's uh, what, I, what one can immediately see uh, with Europe, right? The Euro, the security issue and international relations with Russia, and then also the migration movements and the problems associated with migration. When it comes to ASEAN, and that's really now something I, I should not talk too much about, but what comes into my mind is, of course, first, Singapore's outstanding role in terms of development. Uh, that shows in the overall that still ASEAN can be uh, somehow connect, considered probably developing, I don't like these words, but developing while Europe is maybe developed, but while these words are not very uh, fortunate, uh, they still hint at something correct, I would say. Uh, and of course, we can see that uh, ASEAN and, and the countries of ASEAN have a very specific, uh, again, um, geopolitical uh, position with China sitting there and definitely uh, wanting to in, uh, influence uh, this region. And uh, when you look at the recent coup in, in Burma, for example, you can see that uh, that definitely plays uh, into that direction, right? And uh, also we must say that uh, the continent here is full of potential conflicts and problems. And these are my arrows here, show a few of those uh, zones of uh, um, conflict. So having uh, shown you that, uh, I just thought, and this is very much like brainstorming uh, and not uh, really uh, hardcore research. We do have here, uh, I just made this list of, of a comparison. And I, you can read by yourself, this is not very, as I said, um, informative for those who know anyway. But um, when you look at the uh, two main points, I think that's really important, that common currency and monetary policy is a big difference between the EU, EU and ASEAN. Because the common uh, currency has so many aspects. One is, for example, that those who have that currency cannot devalue it on a national basis, which means that it cannot uh, counter uh, problems with exports and with the economy. This is a big issue for Southern Europe. So the, the, uh, the whole common currency is a huge headache, and that's why 11 countries right, do not have the common currency. And they, of course, want to devalue their currency if necessary. And there are, of course, other issues with the common currency that uh, the monetary policy is uh, uh, done by the ECB and not nationally. It has a huge impact uh, on, on the continent. And, um, and, and that uh, leads to the whole problem, the whole problems with, with Europe and how it is perceived, because too much many countries think is decided in Brussels. Uh, and of course, we have supranational jurisdiction legislation which is exactly, again, a problem zone. And the whole Brexit debate was about that, isn't it? It was about, we do not want to follow laws that are issued in, uh, the, uh, in Brussels. The Conservatives quite clearly stated that this is one of the major issues. They wanted to follow their own legal tradition. So uh, that's, I think, one of the most important, uh, the two most important differences between ASEAN and EU, the first two. While, 
uh, the others, even common uh, defense and security operations, I don't find per se so important because I don't think that uh, a war between nations is so likely. I just don't think so. There might, there might be something with terrorism or so, but I don't think a war between nations will, uh, will be very likely given uh, how dangerous the weapons simply are we have. Uh, so um, this is uh, what I showed here. Um, I have here kind of a brief example of the problems with the EU, for example, right? Being slow, being clumsy with the vaccine. The big stories in Europe that uh, there was a problem with one firm and then they uh, now look again to the Russian vaccine actually and it goes slow and many countries complain. The Hungarians want to go solo and want to do their own thing uh, as often. Uh, and so we have that kind of, of uh, complaints again that the, uh, the Brussels is not actually managing these things flexibly enough and fast enough. So that these are the drawbacks sometimes of such central, central administrations that they are not able to really supply the countries with uh, the flexibility needed, right? So here are some examples of that um, issue. Um, so I hope I have still time to, to round it up with the last points. Uh, so I think that when we speak about potential uh, cooperation and so on, uh, one way of seeing the chances for such cooperation, but also the problems for such cooperation in uh, a field that I, I teach without ever really knowing what exactly that field is, but it's kind of value studies. Axiology is the, the uh, technical term. And there is this, uh, I find quite uh, interesting uh, theory by Schwartz. Uh, he has this theory of basic values. You can see the wheel on the left side of the, uh, of the slide. And um, especially the difference between universalism and uh, benevolence is very interesting because benevolence goes into the, uh, the side of conser conservation. It goes into the side of in-group and caring about, so to speak, your group. That would be more the Trump supporters, if you wish. While uh, the universalists, they are more like, you know, uh, global citizen type of orientations or coastal cities in the U.S. And, uh, and I, I say that because um, that is, of course, echoed by another theory that is very famous by Jonathan Haidt, the, the, this very famous ideas of the moral foundation, uh, uh, psychological foundation, evolutionary foundations of our uh, um, value kind of targets. And here we have uh, his, his uh, dimensions of care, harm, fairness, cheating, loyalty, authority, sanctity, liberty. And of course, authority and sanctity being uh, uh, the hallmarks of conservatives, while uh, those who are more liberal would be more in, in, in oriented towards care, fairness, and uh, prevention uh, from harm. And uh, that's, that's how he, he explains the, the dispute between Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives in the United States that can never be bridged in his easily because of that basic different orientation in terms of uh, um, he would call it biological orientation almost. Uh, so uh, I think these frameworks are quite helpful in understanding first that uh, countries can be seen as a unit and you can just say, okay, this country has this type of orientation mainly. That would be one approach. So you could say, for example, what I hear roughly a sketch, right? That there's this concentration in, uh, on the more uh, modest uh, liberal libertarian side with pretty good capital of the population, socioeconomic capital, I would say that could be a country like, like Sweden or Scandinavian country. And that there's a certain potential, of course, of cooperation if you have that uh, feature. And uh, in, the, in the value study area, there is, of course, this very, I would say, sim simplifying approach to just draw maps like this, right? This is the famous Hofstede uh, idea that is uh, prolonged by um, kind of value uh, survey um, operations. There is a world value survey, a European value survey, and you can find all this data online uh, and you find such maps for all sorts of topics. This is one of the major axes, right? Collectivism, individualism with all the, the countries that are supposed to represent a different degrees of these um, features. Now, having said that, um, that's of course uh, interesting, but 
it doesn't tell the whole story. And that's what uh, Jonathan Haig, the, 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 the social psychologist, actually uh, uh, stresses. There is, of course, conflict within countries. Uh, in a country, uh, you have uh, all sorts of concentrations, as, especially often, of course, the political parties. You have uh, more conservative people, more liberal people. Uh, you have generational conflicts and so forth. And the, and then that's, of course, uh, an issue now in terms of integration and in terms of uh, group building, I find, because, uh, and that's the major point, there is something very strange with the nation, with the nation state. The nation state has uh, somehow achieved something which is miraculous almost, namely to create an identity of people who are, can be so different. And there are very trivial signatures of that identity, I would say, like sports. I find myself often, uh, when I hear that some Austrian has won something, I somehow feel positive about it without knowing why. It is strange. It is really strange why uh, you, you can have certain uh, ideas about that. You can call it also indoctrination if you're critical. But we, we have that kind of uh, incredible bond to our, to our motherland, even if we often criticize it. And it is just there, it seems, despite all the differences uh, of the people. And this is a very strong in-group formation that you can, of course, analyze psychologically, evolutionary, or whatever. But it is very successful still, I would say. And it comes all the way through when we criticize the European Union, in Brexit, and also when um, countries like then certainly Thailand say we don't sign a certain an agreement with ASEAN about uh, coronavirus vaccines. I mean, it just comes through this kind of, why do we need to follow you guys? I mean, we are a single country. Um, it's very strong, and, but there are very powerful um, uh, different forms of integration going on. But I would say they are not necessarily regional, like we are discussing, like ASEAN or EU. They are the result of time sp space compression, which means that simply geographic markers are not so important anymore in the time of the internet and technology. We of course have uh, cohorts, right? Digital cohorts like activists. Famously, just what happened in the United States with the short selling of a stock. I don't know if you followed that story, but it was an incredible uh, social activism. Um, and there are, of course, things that I found recently interesting, like the chess community through the coronavirus has incredibly uh, formed its uh, uh, group building around the world. There are extremely professionally run chess websites now and so many members and interests. So there are people, of course, they have the same interests around the world and they can join together. And that is then, I would say, much stronger a feel of identity besides the national identity than regional in, uh, in, integration. So I find that regional integration is actually uh, way down the list and the regional integration cannot easily match the nation state, simply psychologically. I can't just see it. And I think regional integration can also not uh, do what these uh, uh, cohorts, these digital cohorts can do, to find like-minded people around the world and share your passion for something, your values, and so forth. So uh, I think in terms of identity and, and, and yeah, identity is the right word. Uh, regional integration is, is a real challenge. So I'm almost finished, actually. I, I, I didn't know how to finish exactly, to be really honest with all that. Um, and I apologize for the hodgepodge. Uh, but um, basically, I think because the nation state is still so strong, in the mind of people. It is very difficult to convince people to, that some nation has to give something up for the benefit of the other. And sometimes that is simply uh, still, I mean, the European Union is blamed for that. I'm not sure it's rightly blamed for that, but you could see it with Greece, for example. When the Greece issue came up, there was this whole blame game the Northern European, some Northern European countries say the Greek, Greek people, so, sorry, it's condescending, but the, it was written in, 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 in social media. They are lazy. They can't uh, do their job and we have to bail them out. But of course, there was the counter attack that says at the end, it's only Germany who benefits from all that money that is actually bumped into Greece. So it's this kind of 
conflict, but you can see it's all with uh, nationalities. And suddenly we heard that, oh, Greece should actually still get some money back uh, from the Second World War, and what the Germans did then. So you, uh, everything starts again. So uh, the only way I think regional integration can work is that we can convince people that it's really just to create new opportunities and maybe people are willing to accept that these opportunities are not evenly distributed. Sometimes when you cooperate in a region, it can be that a certain group of people benefits more than another. But if you do it without taking away from someone, it might be accepted. But once you start to have the perception you took away something and giving it to someone from another country, I think we have a problem, to be honest. Uh, this is uh, kind of trivial, it might seem, but I think it's very, a very strong blockage of regional integration, if you go there. And that's why many uh, forms of regional integration, like the ASEAN, I think, don't touch that anyway. They would not go so far. But the European, Europeans, they went that far, and now they can see the problems with, with it, especially Brexit and uh, other issues with member states like Hungary and uh, Poland, for example. Okay, that is actually everything I wanted to say. So um, that's all I can say, actually. <laughs> thank you so much for listening to that. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Moshama, for your uh, really uh, comprehensive philosophical presentation on the broad comparison as well as you know, specific pinpointing of uh, EU and ASEAN regional integrations. So uh, I am sure uh, my colleagues have much to say about you know, these, I mean, your presentation. You know, specific points are really interesting. So I would like to make, uh, late, I mean, later on, I'd like to make my own comments on, on your presentation in the free discussion part. Would that be all right? So thank you very much. So let's uh, cumul okay, take this you know, cumulative approach. Okay, so first uh, we have had uh, Dr. Uh, Moshamar's uh, pre presentation. Okay, so we would like to now invite uh, Dr. Natanari Hosritong uh, for her presentation. And then, uh, okay, we wish to uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Kakayuki Kawase for his uh, uh, presentation. Then uh, we were going to have uh, our commentator as well as a presenter, uh, presenter uh, Professor uh, Jiro uh, Mizushima. So that's uh, the order. So now we would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Natanari Postriton for your uh, presentation, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> and I, I would like to first thank you, um, Shiba University, and also. Professor Ishido, Professor Mitsushima, Dr. Kawase, and of course, Ajahn Jaro um, for uh, being here at this meeting today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, actually, I'm, 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 I'm currently a senior lecturer of uh, international relations and global affairs at MUIC, at Mahidon University International College here in Thailand. And uh, I teach uh, various courses, um, and one of them is, of course, international organizations, um, which directly talks about the integration process, uh, particularly of the European Union and, of course, uh, ASEAN as well. But my actually, my research interest uh, lies in the field of um, history of international relations and also um, gender studies. So hopefully my, my presentation will reflect uh, my interest uh, of my current research and hopefully it will be useful uh, to, to our group meeting today. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sharing my slides now. Um, starting with a bit of um, agenda. So I'm just gonna, since I'm a historian of international relations, uh, I think it's very important to look into the origins, uh, the historical perspective of the integrations between the two organizations, ASEAN uh, versus European Union, um, and then explore a little bit of how they encounter or have overcome some regional challenges. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to compare both cases of ASEAN and the EU. And then, well, since we are at this COVID era, 
uh, COVID-19. So I guess it's important as well to look at the responses of the European Union and ASEAN um, since the past year, how we deal with the situation of COVID-19. And I would like to end this uh, presentation with uh, a little bit of uh, raising the concerns of what are we looking into as we now in 2021, 20, 2021, and this age of global race uh, to vaccine. So that would, that would be the, the rough um, overview of my presentation. Like I said, I'm a historian, so I like to look into the historical perspective uh, when it comes to the inter integrations of the two organization. So you can see from the timeline that I put here, this is a very rough timeline. I'm sure you're quite familiar with this, but just to point out the difference, the differences between the two, uh, you see on the, the column uh, of the, the ASEAN that has emerged around the time of decolonization. Uh, I think Ajahn Gerald also covered these points about like the differences between the two. And, and I think I mean, I, I'm, I'm grateful for your presentation to have already outlined what I plan to do as well in, in my presentation here. So which is uh, decolonization, the Cold War play a very important role, influential role to the emergence of both organization. But if we look at it closely, if we look at them closely, the emergences of the two organizations were slightly on different grounds. Um, the EU on one hand, is uh, focused on uh, the economic rehabilitation after World War II, as you uh, might have heard of the Marshall Plan, the American Aid. So that serves as the main kind of a key foundation to the emergence of the organization. But on the other hand, we see uh, ASEAN as uh, an organization that was more political during its first establishment in the former version called CETO. And, uh, stands for Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, which is, of course, the similar form that is used by other American organizations, such as, uh, you know, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So basically, uh, a lot of uh, historians, I mean, we, we all know that this is part of somehow American expansion uh, theory uh, in Asia, in Southeast Asia. And then, of course, when we talk about economic integration, which Ajahn Ishido also mentioned at the very beginning of the meeting today, we started to, to see that emerging in the EU much, much earlier before uh, ASEAN. We started to see that form since already uh, 1951 with the coal and steel community. Of course, later on, it developed into uh, EEC, European Economic Community, and the EU and so on. But in the case of ASEAN, what we see here is, is that uh, the, uh, the ASEAN Economic Community has already emerged, has only emerged in uh, 2015, which is much later on. So comparing the two emergence, um, the two establishments here, the timeline here, you can see that, of course, we would expect that uh, the EU, European Union, would be a model that that the uh, that ASEAN and all other organizations would try to follow because they were much more integrated than anyone else way before any other regional organizations. But nevertheless, in terms of uh, challenges, which is the next point that I want to to raise, the regional challenges we have seen that both of them have actually many similarities. Uh, with the integration process. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, the inequalities, uh, gap, economic gaps between, uh, between countries in the region. Uh, I've got here the map first of the, United, uh, of the European Union, uh, the inequalities between um, European uh, members, states, and uh, as we have discussed earlier, the the original kind of um, the original inequalities were seen first in the east versus the west, and that's of course due to the Cold War and everything. But then, of course, later on we started to see north versus south as well. But according to like the according to the latest uh, research, the um, when we do the S twenty S eighty 
2080 ratio, the comparison of income. Uh, in Europe, we, we, I just thought that this figure might be interesting to you, that in Europe, we've seen the highest inequality when we measure the 20% of the richest households uh, in comparison to the poorest households in the country, in each of country in Europe. Um, the biggest gap or the highest inequality ratio uh, is seen in Bulgaria with 7.9. So basically that means the rich actually earn uh, 7.9 times higher than the poorest households. So I thought this interesting, this interesting figures, I'm not the economist myself, I'm sure uh, you, professors, you are more of an economist than myself, but I think this is a very good factor, a very good, 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 good figure to explain uh, the problem of inequality that still exists. Uh, even though we, we thought that this was, you know, has started from the beginning, from the origin of the integration process in Europe, but actually it's still persisting, it's still, it's still happening until now. Okay, so we have the, the lowest, for example, the lowest um, inequality, uh, sorry, the highest inequality gap uh, that is measured by the latest research would be the first place in Bulgaria, second and third uh, are in Lithuania and Romania, and all of them are in the red, red uh, highlighted areas that are shown on this map here. But apart from that, uh, we also have recently learned that Europe is also facing with the slow growth, and namely these countries in blue areas, the Mediterranean countries, so like uh, Portugal, Spain, um, parts of Italy, and also, of course, Greece. So basically, uh, in um, European uh, economic gap is still very big and something that uh, serve as a very uh, as a as a main issue of the of uh, main challenges of the region. One of the main challenges of the region. Similarly to EU, like I said, the two even though come from different backgrounds, uh, form in slightly different timeline, but ASEAN also uh, encountered a similar problem. Actually, of course, even worse than in Europe. In terms of the income inequality, we, we, we see, uh, we've been recorded that, we have recorded that the high, we have the, one of the highest income inequalities in the world. Uh, and in ASEAN, surprisingly, it is Thailand that has the highest income inequality. When you measure, again, like I said, the richest to the poorest in the country. So this is something that ASEAN has to overcome. And I guess this is, very much uh, linked to the next point on this slide where I said, this is also reflecting on uh, their, uh, the way that they deal, they deal with problems. And, and I will mention more in detail with COVID-19 later, but um, the fact that they have to uh, overcome so many problems such as economic, uh, economic inequalities. So when, when it comes to dealing with that internal and external security challenges, they can't act so uh, collectively, unlike, of course, with the EU, that maybe uh, they have more organism, more mechanisms that can that can help uh, implement uh, their collective uh, collective actions. But in case of ASEAN, uh, we tend to have divergent interests here and priorities. So, like Ajahn Juro also mentioned, that we have. Uh, the the national states, right? The national states is still uh, is still more important. Uh, can cannot match with uh, the the sorry the regional the regional movement. The regional organization cannot really match with nation states, and that's exactly the story that I that I see here with ASEAN. And uh, even though EU has developed before, still encounter with with this kind of challenge. Uh, this kind of challenges. So these are like some of the challenges that I thought could mention. Now coming to this age, this era of COVID-19, um, I will start first by talking about, about the case of the European Union. Okay. So in, in, in the European Union, I think the best way to explain the situation 
of the European now in response to COVID-19 would be this uh, particular phrase that I took from um, the academic uh, journals that I have gone through this past couple of weeks. Um, no one's world. I think this is a very powerful statement and something that maybe we can even discuss further. Basically, no one's world, uh, according to Ruloff here, uh, in the latest article published just last year, um, he explained that it is referring to the situation where uh, no country and no group of countries has leverage, neither political nor economic, to promote and drive an international agenda or to provide global public goods. So basically, it's referring to exactly the, the situation that's happening now in the EU and also, I think, worldwide, that and there is no particular country that want to step up to help or to provide uh, what we need during this, uh, this uh, pandemic. So no one's world is actually, I think, a powerful phrase here uh, when we talk about the global pandemic of COVID-19. So the question that I raise next is, could the EU contribute more uh, to its global role since the EU, many of its members, of course, are the most, influ most influential uh, states or what we call the global influencers, the global influencer states. Uh, could they do more? Actually, I came across one, uh, one positive, uh, one positive res response, uh, maybe not acted uh, as the EU action, but it, it was the initiative uh, from France, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands called the Inclusive Vaccine Alliance. I don't know how many of you have heard about that, but I thought that what uh, they, they have already uh, planned the uh, IVA here, uh, Inclusive Vaccine Alliance, since last year in, 2000 and, uh, in 20 and 20. And uh, of course, their first, first initiative was to uh, uh, somehow have make sure that the vaccines uh, are manufactured in Europe. So this is something that, that, that I see as the early, one of the, one of the most uh, collaborative, uh, col uh, collective form of responses that the European states have, have done so far. And I think, of course, this is a, a good initiative if, if the EU could take on from this um, to expand to other members, of course, this will be very useful. So looking at the four countries that initiated uh, this inclusive vaccine alliance, France, Germany, Italy, the, the Netherlands, we, we can see from this list of countries that they are uh, like four out of five largest economies in Europe. So they have very high purchasing power. And uh, I think that the four uh, could make a lot of difference if this uh, inclusive vaccine alliance uh, came through. Okay? So um, that's in the case of the EU response. For ASEAN response, however, I, I apologize for this small slide, but basically uh, this is the statistic, uh, sorry, this is a chart, the, the table that I got from the ASEAN, uh, from, from one of the articles I read um, on ASEAN. So basically that ASEAN responded um, differently um, than the Euro European Union. Uh, it, it, it's more to do with uh, like uh, what we mentioned before, the national, the national states, uh, the, the national priorities over the collective one. So we've, we've, we've seen that even though, so I like the first part I mentioned before I get to the table, uh, even though ASEAN has been somehow somewhat prepared to deal with epidemics, you know, from the previous epidemics that we have had, such as uh, SARS, H1N1, and so on. Um, but still, you know, when COVID-19 uh, uh, happened, when, when we saw the, the epidemic coming, the national policy seems to dominate this supranational cooperation more uh, than it should be, okay? Um, so uh, taking the example, like I put here, like, like while the WHO is, uh, you know, trying to 
uh, to regulate, to actively, uh, you know, to, 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 to advise on tracking uh, and tracing cases. I mean, these were already only implemented in certain countries, like in Singapore and Malaysia, but not in, you know, develop the so-called developing countries where they have weaker healthcare systems. So I, I took the, the, the information from particularly two countries just to show you a quick, a quick comparison uh, of Singapore and Cambodia here. Um, so Singapore and Cambodia, of course, we know they are very different, but, but just to clearly demonstrate um, the different manners, the different ways that they deal with COVID-19, you can see that uh, Cambodia was, was, uh, was totally, I mean, uh, um, putting the national interest first, um, such as uh, what it says here, the, they wanted to maintain the close relationship with China, so they tend to act reluctantly when it first uh, when we uh, when we look back in April 20 and 20 like in the in the first uh, sorry in the third column in the third column of this table here so Cambodia act like uh, were basically underestimated the risk of COVID-19 initially and ref refused to apply any strict action and this is simply because they want to maintain the close relationship with China but on the other hand, of course, we've seen uh, Singapore as the global leader, not only the regional leader, but the global leader. It had already, uh, you know, deal with a lot of uh, elements, including the pockets of migrant worker cases, active cases among migrant workers. So, of course, the two countries show the big, the big contrast and show, the, show that like I said on the, the, the heading of this slide here, that again that we have uh, in ASEAN here, uh, one vision, one identity, one community is basically just a utopia because uh, even though we have also all kinds of uh, platforms that have established earlier, but we can't really use them, okay? And, and so Singapore was, was much more uh, precautious with this uh, than some with we, uh, some country, some countries with weaker health healthcare system. Okay. Do I ha I have time, right? Yeah. Um, so, the the next slide. I just want to now that we um, are at uh, in two thousand and twenty one. I would like us all maybe to start thinking about uh, this global race to vaccine this global race to vaccine and see like what can be what can be the problems or how can we overcome the challenges maybe some of them are already existing uh, existed uh, challenges but but of course it's now uh, with the with a pandemic of course things are much more difficult so first first column on the left here uh, this is uh, what I put here, vaccine nationalism versus regionalism. This is definitely going to be the, the biggest issue that we have to overcome in not only in this year, but per perhaps next year and few more years. Uh, regionalism, uh, exactly like what, we've, uh, what I have discussed, regionalism, would it be placed before nationalism, especially when it comes to vaccine, right? To the race, uh, to the global race to vaccine. Um, this is, of course, can be, I think this can be, uh, can be encouraged uh, to a positive, uh, to, 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 to a positive way, it doesn't have to be always negative. If the EU, for example, can improve, can improve its global role, I think uh, we can, we can promote further regional uh, regional cooperation when it comes to vaccine and also I as I said here RCN also as um, as a region with high capacity of manufacturing uh, manufacturing um, so RCN can also, could also be seen as a vaccine manufacturing hub actually it's been already raised by some of the politicians that RCN could be promoted as a new hub of uh, vaccine manufacturing uh, I believe that was the Prime Minister of Malaysia who's mentioned that recently. So uh, EU and ASEAN, of course, have high potential to go beyond 
uh, vaccine nationalism and, and going to a global level. Okay? So that's one, one concern. Other concerns, of course, uh, this is to do with the impact of uh, the pandemic itself. The second column in the middle here, uh, the inequalities. This is something that we can't really, really uh, avoid. And, and like I said, it's already one of the challenges that both the European Union and ASEAN have been, uh, have been encountering from the beginning until now, one of the persisting uh, problems. Um, so when we look into this year, 2021, Poverty is still the main issue, especially in ASEAN countries, I guess. Uh, in implementing strict lockdowns, we've still seen um, in many areas across ASEAN that uh, have been obstructed by the poverty level. So poverty is still an issue here. And if we can't overcome poverty, then how can we, you know, uh, come up with further, further, uh, further, methods, further implementations uh, to prevent the future uh, break, uh, outbreaks of, the, of other epidemics that might come in the future. Um, apart from that, inequality is still, of course, one of the, I think, main issues that we should look at when we look at the consequences of the pandemic. Rights of the vulnerable groups, the second point. Rights of vulnerable groups, including uh, migrant workers, refugees, IDPs. These are the people that maybe um, in U I, I, I'm sure the, the figure in Europe is high as well. But I got a figure from 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 ASEAN that uh, if we talk about just just migrant workers alone, migrant workers in informal sectors in 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 around ASEAN is approximately up to 200 million workers in total. So that means we have a lot of, of workers who are not in the system, uh, in the system. And they are the ones who would be uh, facing, uh, having problem, having difficulty in getting uh, access to healthcare or even va vaccine that, it, that we are, you know, raising towards uh, to vaccines at the moment. So this will be uh, this will be um, the, the another group of people that would uh, that that uh, or that ASEAN and of course EU uh, also should be uh, focusing on um, migrant workers. Also, I think this 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 group of people, refugees, IDPs, uh, could raise another uh, could could also raise the issue of vaccine nationalism. Um, I. We, it, well, as we are living in Thailand, as I am living in Thailand, of course, the current outbreak happened in Samusakon province, which is um, the cluster of migrant workers, uh, mainly the Burmese workers. And I mean, there are already people up, um, to, who are talking about if we get the vaccines, should we give, it, should we give the vaccine to the migrant workers? Uh, since they are the, you know, the, the, the biggest cluster in the country right now, or should we give to the Thai citizens? So who get the vaccine first? I think this is the, the main problem of vaccine nationalism. That's not only just, you know, about uh, global level. It's not only about the global level uh, issue, but it's also uh, the, the, the regional and even like the national issues. And last but not least, like I mentioned from the beginning, I'm a gender, a gender, uh, gender lecturer myself. So um, gender setback is also something that maybe um, is not mentioned enough when we talk about the pandemic. Actually, girls, women um, also uh, were largely impacted by, by the pandemic during the lockdown, not only just access to vaccines, but uh, during the, lo the lockdown, there already had been uh, reports on the rising cases of domestic violence, for example. So domestic violence, the access to education in many, especially in, especially in, in areas with high poverty uh, for girls, uh, for women. So gender setback would, would also be still something that we have to overcome as one of the challenges during this global race to vaccine. And the last column uh, here, 
um, is of course we have to mention that uh, the civil rights would be something that um, um, the violation of civil rights, civil rights also could be affected by this uh, pandemic. Uh, looking at how uh, demonstrations, public demonstrations are banned due to the fact that governments declare state of emergencies, for example. So this could be, I think this happened in, in, in Hungary, in, in Europe, as well as, of course, in Thailand, uh, we have the ban of demonstrations. So uh, I think there are really, like all, all of these are just very, uh, like very rough outlines. Um, I don't have, uh, I don't have the information to go into the detail yet, but I guess as a group we, we can. Um, but just, uh, obviously these are the points that, um, that, we, that we have to be uh, concerned with when it comes to um, looking into this global race to vaccine. So I think I will finish it here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for your uh, really, uh, uh, again, a, a comprehensive historical overview of the comparison of EU and ASEAN, as well as, uh, you know, more specific issue. I mean, you're addressing of, uh, a more specific issue about COVID-19, um, the, re the response of the uh, EU and, and the response of uh, ASEAN to this, you know, very serious ongoing issue. So uh, we really uh, appreciate your uh, uh, research input, uh, Dr. Pokri Tom. Thank you very much. I have so many things to, uh, I mean, remark on, but uh, let us move on because this is going to be a cumulative type of, you know, <laughs> process. So uh, let us uh, then uh, invite uh, Dr. Takayuki Kawase for his own uh, philosophically or, or the, uh, oriented presentation. Okay, so uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Kawase. Okay, please. Thank you very much, Professor Ishido. I am uh, Takayuki Kaose, and I teach philosophy of law in Chiba University here. And actually, I uh, was invited to a seminar of Professor Moshama last year when the COVID situation was uh, started. And at that time, I spoke about my uh, theory of liberal nationalism. So this is actually the nationalism theory. So. Basically, um, I am for and I support uh, for the value of nation state, but I think it does not uh, matter at all for uh, explaining uh, the advantage of the uh, regional integrations. So I want to share the, my file and, ah, yes. Quick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do you see it? Okay. So today I want to start my um, discussion about regional integration by referring to the arguments for liberal nationalism. My title here is In What Conditions Is Regional Integration Possible? So I'd like to consider various um, or some uh, conditions which unite people from the perspective of liberal nationalism. And I will apply this theory to the uh, actual situation of EU or ASEAN and Far East Asian countries, including Japan, China, and Korea. So um, at the beginning, let me define my own idea of liberal nationalism. In my opinion, liberalism and nationalism are compatible. So this is uh, the most important and probably only uh, message of the uh, theory of liberal nationalism. Of course, a lot of um, actual phenomena of nationalism are illiberal. 
So as you know, now we have so many examples of illiberal nationalism. And so, um, so we have a lot of example in our history, but it does not mean that uh, liberal nationalism is impossible. I think nationalism is uh, or can be a useful instrument for liberalism. And liberalism is a useful, uh, can be used for uh, uh, instrument for uh, nationalism, vice versa. Each can be a good instrument for the other. For a liberal society to be maintained, uh, the stability and the prosperity of national community is useful. And for a national community to be stable and prosper, liberal society must be maintained. There are so many uh, conceptions of liberalism uh, the uh, liberal egalitarian or libertarian or um, the social liberalism or any kind of such a thing. And each theorist of liberalism has um, their own conception of that. According to my conception of liberalism, every person in a society must enjoy equal and wide context of choices in the life as much as possible. In this sense, my liberalism is combined with uh, uh, egalitarianism. So um, I support for the equality of opportunity. On the other hand, there are many conceptions of nationalism as well. And I adopt the conception of nationalism as a claim for uh, the integration of people. For example, nationalism, which insists to integrate nation into a single religion contradicts liberalism, which uh, respects uh, the freedom of faith, the freedom of the religion. On the other hand, nationalism, which insists to integrate nation into a single institution of social security or uh, the single constitution or uh, any other kind of uh, legal system may not contradict, but rather help the idea of the uh, or value of the egalitarian liberalism. Um, by the way, let me explain my intellectual background. My major is philosophy of law. And if I can locate my theory in the literature of the legal philosophy or political philosophy, my arguments are close to that of David Miller or Will Kimrika or uh, Joseph Ross. And uh, it is very far from Robert Nozick and Chandran Kukasas. So basically I am close to the liberal socialist or national socialist or communitarian. Uh, and I am against libertarian. And today, I would like to consider about in what conditions regional integration is possible. Originally, I researched the conditions of the integration of national communities. However, because any national communities are artificial and arbitrary categories, as you know, so the national uh, community is the uh, imagined community, so it is uh, the fiction. Uh, so uh, it is uh, interchangeable to many other social groups in my theory. Um, so um, therefore, I try to apply my uh, arguments for liberal nationalism to the arguments for the regional integration. In what follows, I pick up four conditions, but there are neither necessary nor sufficient conditions for the regional integration. However, I believe they are at least very important condition for the integration of a lot of society. The first, um, is the integration of the languages, so um, the single or plural. Uh, according to Charles Taylor, a Canadian political philosopher, uh, or 
philosopher, probably. Um, language has two important functions. The first is designation. This is, uh, so I think um, this is very um, similar uh, with the idea that Dr. Moshima said at the first. So um, the uh, contrast between the description and uh, descriptive thing and normative thing. So this is a kind of the description of the world. By this function, we can sketch how the world is and transmit the knowledge or information about it to other people. The second is uh, expression and creation. We create a lot of things by using language. For example, greetings are not for the description of the world, but for the expression to create a good relation to other people. Another example is praise and brave. So by them, we create values and they are turned into morality, roles, and social institutions. If it is true, when people share languages, it might be a great advantage for them to share social institutions. When they make corrective decisions, they do it by using specific languages among those who share it, so share the languages, and on behalf of those who share it. Conversely saying, it is quite difficult to integrate people who do not share languages. I think this is one of the reasons because of which EU suffers, the European Union suffers the deficiency of democracy. Now, how about in Asia? In the Far East countries, Japan, Korea, and China, the integration of languages is quite difficult, or I think almost impossible in the foreseeable future. However, in ASEAN, I think spread of English uh, might promote a sort of linguistic integration. The second, uh, is the integration of the institution for social security. By social security, I mean mutual aid through official institutions, for example, government. And, and so uh, the national government probably, um, or uh, local government or regional or global government probably. And the mutual aid is possible in the market or community as well. So um, the private company or uh, in the uh, religious church or uh, the, uh, in family, I think it is possible as well. For example, in many pre-modern societies, uh, religious churches or temples. So in Japan, I think the Buddhist temple had a lot of uh, responsibility. And I think it is not very different in Thailand and Yes, I think so. And took some uh, responsibilities for social security. Nevertheless, in the modern world, welfare state has a responsibility, especially in the well-developed countries. This fact made it possible that we can enjoy a lot of policies of social securities, feature much larger and easily enforceable than those by market, community, or any other private association. So I think this is a very, very big advantage of the um, uh, welfare state or the legal system that we can enforce uh, the policy of the mutual aid. And this kind of institutions are enabled by people sharing common sense on what is the minimum decent life. That means uh, what is the human basic needs. According to liberal nationalism, such kind of common sense is mainly shared in a national community. So, of course, I know it is not only inside the national uh, community, but I think 
uh, we can say at least national community is one of the most important uh, communities that we can share the common sense about uh, uh, human basic needs. And uh, it follows that a welfare state must be a nation state. However, uh, there can be alternatives if our common sense on decent life or human basic needs spread beyond the national borders, international integration or regional in in integration of social security institutions could be possible. Um, I, yeah, I think the EU is one of the examples. So um, it is not uh, so um, ambitious um, that they achieved the uh, institution of mutual aid, but I think it is one of the examples. So I think that in EU, people are roughly sharing the idea of minimum decent life or human basic needs uh, or human uh, dignity. But I guess in ASEAN and Far East Asian countries, it is still um, underdeveloped. So, but I think it does not mean it is impossible. I guess or I hope it will be possible in future, but anyway, it is uh, still underdeveloped in my opinion. And number three, <clears throat> one of the most important questions in philosophy of law, my major, is distributive justice. This is the issue how to share social goods or social costs among people in just or fair ways. Most of discussions on distributive justice focuses on what is the contents of the principles of distributive justice. But then we try to deal with the issue of social integrations we have to consider the question of what is the good frameworks of the distributive justice. So um, frameworks such as local community or nation state or international or regional uh, government or global society or such kind of frameworks is uh, another uh, issue. And here um, I want to think about that. This is a question of in what conditions people are subject to a single framework of distributive justice. And by the way, I believe in the plurality of values. So I think that a person should be able to be subject to uh, some different plural authorities or distributive justice at the same time. So I do not argue for the singleness of the framework. Instead of that, my question here is that, what are the condition by which people can be integrated into a single framework of distributive justice? One possible answer is uh, economic uh, interaction and cooperation. So according to John Rawls, uh, the, uh, a theory of justice, the justice is the basic structure of a society and the society is a system of cooperation. So the existence of the uh, social cooperation bring about the necessity of justice. Probably many people feel it the request of the distributive justice that when uh, some fellow citizens are starving, uh, hungry, uh, we should help them through our government or any other uh, methods. However, what if the same kind of starvation or hunger uh, or poverty happened in, the, uh, in a different planet far from the earth? So this is a science fiction. Uh, we usually think it is not the request of justice to help them, even if it were technically possible. Actually, it is not po technically possible, but even if it were technically possible, it is not the request of the justice. 
uh, because uh, we have as uh, a relationship of economic interaction or uh, cooperation with our fellow citizens, but not with aliens. A different, uh, the, a difficult question here is what degree of interaction makes what degree of the request of justice? In my opinion, emergency aid for those who are under the absolute poverty line, uh, probably one dollar for a day, actually I'm not sure about that, but um, the absolute poverty line must be uh, universal all over this world. So this is a question of the global justice. And I think another example is a basic need such as um, uh, the vaccine of the COVID-19 because the life and health is the most important human or most primitive human needs. And uh, the distributive of uh, vaccine, as uh, a distribution of the vaccine must be the issue of global justice. So um, the, uh, even liberal nationalists uh, do not against uh, such kind of the, uh, global justice. Uh, so I am very uh, worried about the nationalistic movement of the uh, monopolizing the vaccine of COVID-19. But on the other hand, uh, the egalitarianism, so uh, in uh, my theory, it means uh, uh, the equality of opportunity of such kind of thing must be uh, limited in a national community. And uh, I think ASEAN may be somewhere in between them. So uh, the strictly, uh, strictly limited into a uh, single nation state or the uh, global uh, justice. So probably ASEAN is uh, somewhere in between. And Far East countries are the same, in my opinion. And the fourth one, the last one. Uh, the most important condition uh, for me and as a liberal nationalist is the last one, the integration of identity. So this is very um, vague and abstract idea, but it is um, actually very important idea in the theory of uh, liberal nationalist. I mean that uh, people feel themselves as members uh, constituting a single society people do not make a claim of justice to an authority which they do not think their own, no matter how strongly they, uh, uh, they have economic interaction with it. For example, the situation of Japanese college students' job hunting is heavily influenced by the economic policy of Chinese government or American government or um, any of other uh, foreign government, I think. Uh, but Japanese students make their claims about the labor policy to Japanese government, not to Chinese. People make a claim of justice inside their own group. It is because moral indignation or moral anger are evoked when they feel uh, to be treated in an unfair way, even if they are the same co-member or co-nationals of a morally important group. So in uh, the case of the liberal nationalists, um, uh, even if they're uh, the same co-nationals of a morally important group uh, such as nations. For example, Chinese people from inland countryside area may feel the gap of life opportunities to that of Chinese uh, people from the urban coast side, so the uh, rich area. Uh, so this uh, gap uh, feels uh, unfair, but uh, they might not feel this gap to that of Swiss people, for example, um, so much unfair. So it does not the uh, it is not the problem. Uh, of course, Swiss people are very rich, uh, but uh, it is not a serious problem as the gap between the countryside and coastside inside China. Uh, 
And I think the sense of identity is a very important condition of the institutional integration. In the Far East Asian countries, national identity is very important rather than other regions. So in my opinion, uh, Far East Asia is one of the most nationalistic area in the world. So uh, here in Japan, the national identity is very important. I, and I think in Korea and in China, it is not very different, I guess. How about in ASEAN? Actually, I am not very sure about that. So please tell me if you uh, know something about it. So uh, finally, the conclusion. So uh, number one, uh, share of languages. Number two, uh, common sense of the basic needs or uh, human needs. And number three, economic interaction or cooperation. And number four, identity. Are important conditions of the social inter integration. Repeatedly saying these are neither the necessary nor sufficient conditions for social inter uh, integration. Just important conditions. But still, I think this, uh, they are very important uh, conditions in my opinion. So now, according to the current situation of the world, how about the prospect of the regional integration in the future? Um, in EU, condition two and three, uh, so it means the, uh, the common sense of the basic needs and the economic interaction uh, are enough, in my opinion. And four, the identity uh, is disappearing now, I think. And one is now, uh, so the language is now on the balance in between the superpower of the power of English and the multiculturalist protection of the uh, minority languages such as Gaelic <laughs> and uh, Basque or such kind of thing, uh, Celtic. Um, and, and uh, the uh, integrations of uh, EU have uh, developed these decades, but it is uh, stagnant and weakened now. So actually, um, probably Professor Mizushima uh, will uh, tell us a lot of things about that after. Um, in the Far East, uh, drastic promotion of regional integration is very difficult in the foreseeable future, unfortunately. Um, only condition three, so the economic uh, cooperation is enough, but other conditions, number one, two, and four, uh, does not exist even in a primitive way uh, in the uh, uh, Far East Asia, so Japan, Korea, and China. And ASEAN is one of the uh, regions about which we can be optimistic for its regional integrations, in my opinion. The largest obstacles for them in ASEAN may be number one and number four, and uh, the language and the identity. But uh, they're not so formidable as uh, in other regions such as Japan and other Far East. However, um, they should be uh, very careful for the lessons of EU. Rapid uh, promotions of the integration maybe bring about uh, elitism and people's emotional hostility against it. So I think the um, uh, Donald Trump movement in America is, I think, such uh, example, um, in my opinion. And they should uh, promote regional integration very carefully and gradually if they truly want to achieve it. So this idea comes from my uh, conservative opinion. So I am basically conservative. So um, in my opinion, any kinds of the social change must be done very carefully. And it uh, definitely must come uh, from from inside that society and never imposed from outside. So um, by the way, and this uh, is all for my presentation. Thank you very much.
Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Kawase, for your uh, uh, really philosophical uh, conceptualization of uh, this regional integration with uh, some uh, more remarks on what is actually happening in the context of uh, COVID-19. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so, okay, we are accumulating, accumulating our presentations. So now uh, we would like to um, uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Jiro Mizushima for his remarks. Uh, his remarks actually include, uh, I mean, uh, making uh, comments or questions about uh, uh, Dr. Moshamar's and Dr. Uh, Potriton's uh, presentations. And also, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kawase's presentation will also be referred to. And then Professor uh, uh, Mizushima will also give his presentation. And then the title of uh, his presentation is Regional integration in the age of Brexit, disintegration or a new start. So uh, it's going to be, a, a, I mean, a really a comprehensive, uh, you know, uh, commenting as well as a presentation. So please welcome uh, uh, Professor Mizushima. Okay. <laughs> so hello, my name is uh, Jiro Mizushima. Um, I'm a political scientist uh, and actually I studied the politics of the Netherlands and uh, comparative politics, and my special uh, topic is uh, populism in comparative, uh, uh, comparative uh, perspective. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I'm interested in the, uh, the development of European integration because the target, main target of European populism is uh, EU. Uh, they are against uh, integration, European integra integration, and they uh, like uh, sovereign states. Now, uh, I would like to uh, make some comments and uh, some uh, questions uh, about your presentation. Uh, thank you for your presentation. The, uh, the present, your presentations were, were really insightful and uh, they shed new light on uh, the study on the comparative uh, regional integration. Uh, now, I would like to make some um, uh, sh quite short, short uh, presentation uh, about regional integration. Uh, my title is, as Professor Ishido said, regional integration in the age of Brexit, disintegration or a new start. Uh, as you all know, uh, United Kingdom, Britain left EU definitely in the end of January uh, 2020 as a result of the Brexit referendum in 2016. The outcome of the Brexit referendum was quite surprising for Europe and the whole world. Some argue that Brexit is the result of the failure, failure of regional integration in Europe, and it is the beginning of European disintegration. In retrospect, in the 20th century, the European integration was seen as a model case, a successful case of regional integration. And as you know, theories about regional integration owed much to the successful developments of European integration. Uh, in, uh, from the end of uh, 20th century, uh, until the uh, beginning of 21st century, we saw the increase of numbers of countries in EU, the enlargement of policy areas, and the introduction of common currency, EU. Thank you. However, after that turn of the century, we saw growing skepticism towards EU, and especially in United Kingdom, there anti-EU sentiments was shared by the so-called left behind people in old industrial areas, which once were the heartland of British Industrial Revolution. Anyway, United Kingdom left EU and at the end of last year uh, in in 2020, the, the last day of 2020, uh, you, you, are, uh, you, saw, you are seeing the uh, PowerPoint slide, uh, regional intervention. 
okay? Um, and, uh, uh, and the last uh, the last day, they reached an important agreement on trade and other future relationship between United Kingdom and Europe. As a result, free trade between UK and EU was narrowly secured. However, now it is certain that the golden age of regional integration in Europe was gone away. Then, how should we evaluate this recent unexpected development? Is Brexit the beginning of regional disintegration, as some scholars suppose? I myself think that we don't have to be so pessimistic. Uh, as you know, recently, United Kingdom has applied for the membership of uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. It was announced on January uh, thir uh, uh, 31st, just one year after Brexit, one, uh, one week before. At first sight, it seems curious that United Kingdom, an European country, wants to join Trans-Pacific Framework. Uh, United Kingdom is not a Pacific country, uh, people might say. However, if we look more closely, we could understand the background easily. Half of the nations in TPP share common language, uh, English-speaking countries, and um, they share common culture with United Kingdom. And they are familiar to British legal systems. In that sense, United Kingdom is a natural member of TPP, we could say. So if we look at the Brexit from global perspective, Brexit uh, is, it could be a development towards a new phase of regional integration in the world. It is, we are, uh, it is, we are sure that Brexit is a disturbing, quite disturbing factor for EU and EU leaders uh, don't want it. However, from global perspective, it could be a new phase of global regional integration. In this age of Brexit and dynamic change of Pacific region, I hope uh, we could foster cross cooperation between Thailand, Japan, and between uh, Mahidong University and Chiba University. Uh, this is my uh, short comment. And I would make quite short comment uh, on each of the presentation. Next page. About presentation by uh, Professor Moshamara. Oh, uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, uh, I think I don't fully understand uh, your philosophical reasoning because I'm not so uh, familiar with philosophical uh, aspects. However, uh, your comparison between EU and ASEAN are quite, uh, is quite interesting. And you pointed out that currency and jurisdiction in these two fields, uh, EU have advantage and it, they have reached, uh, they have uh, achieved quite strong inter integration. Uh, but on the other side, I think um, if we think about the background of Brexit, we see uh, some kind of paradox of strong integration because EU has developed so strong uh, integration, uh, the reaction of the peripheral countries, Britain or other uh, countries could be strong. Uh, the, uh, the, the integration process is so strong that some member states could not follow the free, full process of integration. So 
Britain refused to join uh, the Eurozone and they don't want to be under the control of East uh, European Court of Justice. Uh, in contrast, uh, in ASEAN, there is no such strong integration institution, uh, but therefore, uh, 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 there is no such Brexit in uh, ASEAN, I think. And about presentation by Professor Nat uh, Postri, Post, uh, Postri Chong, uh, uh, it is quite, uh, your presentation was quite interesting, uh, especially for me about the comparison uh, historical background. And now you point out the Vaccine uh, Alliance. Alliance. Alliance uh, by EU. Uh, but uh, from the news uh, recently, uh, probably you know about the uh, British selfish uh, behavior about vaccine, uh, especially AstraZeneca vaccine. So they want to monopolize the vaccine and EU cannot fully get the vaccine they wanted to get. So, so but this quite curious situation could be seen as a result of the selfish Brexit because Britain can get their uh, lion's share and they they can exclude EU interference. Uh, and it happened uh, in one uh, <coughs> sense because of Brexit. Uh, so uh, Brexit uh, <coughs> could make it uh, easy to exclude European continental interference uh, for Britain. So uh, what do you think about this? Uh, vasting war between selfish UK and uh, alliance. And uh, for the presentation of Professor Hawase, uh, you pointed out quite interesting uh, points about uh, regional integration and liberal nationalism. And uh, I think <laughs> it is quite uh, uh, insightful uh, because you pointed out the sharing of language is important. And uh, if we look at the recent developments, uh, uh, in one sense, language played, played a quite important factor because uh, in Europe, in continental Europe, there is no country uh, where uh, people uh, speak in English as a mother tongue. <laughs> Uh, however, in the countries in TPP, uh, people uh, speak more English. Uh, so, and uh, common language English. Uh, for, so, so uh, for Britain, uh, TPP is uh, more comfortable than EU. <laughs> it be, it, uh, we must say. So anyway, so, uh, we, if we look at the recent developments in the world, uh, some important developments could be interpreted as uh, from the viewpoint of uh, language and values and culture. Not only uh, uh, economics uh, and economy uh, plays important role, but that's not uh, that's only one uh, aspect, I think. Uh, thank you for the interdisciplinary uh, interpretations and explanations, and uh, I hope we can uh, discuss uh, more uh, uh, in details. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mizushima, um, for your presentation as well as uh, uh, <clears throat> to the point uh, comments uh, about uh, the three presentations. So. Uh, I'd like to uh, now uh, invite back uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Moshanmar to, uh, I mean, uh, make some more uh, input uh, based on uh, Professor Mizushima's comment, please. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yes. 
Um, I must say, I, I think uh, we actually uh, do agree. Um, it was just uh, um, summarized much better. The, the issue that I wanted to say with uh, the paradox of strong integration is an excellent term, I think. Uh, what I wanted to, to highlight as well, actually, uh, when, when um, we have a common cur currency and when we have um, um, an legislation and jurisdiction that is above the nation, then problems begin, I think, because, as I emphasized, the, uh, the, the idea of the nation state is still very strong and the identity that comes through the nation state is very strong. And it also has simply to do with the democratic process. There are elections, European Union elections, but it does not really count for the people, really. People just think, uh, maybe wrongly, but they think through electing a national government to have some influence, but through electing uh, the European Union and a parliament, they don't. And also the, the participation is much lower. People just don't go and vote for the EU. So you can here see that there is a, uh, exactly the problem of, of maybe overshooting integration and by overshooting integration, to create a dynamics that, uh, yeah, dials the whole thing back. And we do not, instead of making progress, we actually fall back to a much worse state than we could have had being slower and being more modest in the ambitions. So um, I think that's, that's the, indeed, the paradox of strong integration des describes it very well. I think it's a perfect phrase. Okay. Oh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ichama. So, uh, can I uh, also uh, invite uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kofriton for any uh, remarks, response remarks, please? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, the, um, for raising such an important point from my presentation. Um, as, you, as you raised the question, what do you think about the vaccine war that's happening, right, between selfish UK uh, during this Brexit, after this Brexit, and uh, against this vaccine alliance. Um, my thought on this would be that um, this is not just a war of vaccines between uh, UK and the, uh, the EU members, but this is a war of vaccines. Uh, if we look at from the perspective of the European Union, this is a war of vaccines between European Union and kind of everyone else, even um, inside Europe itself. Um, you might have heard recently about the Russian vaccine, right? The Russian vaccine, the Sputnik, which is now proven to be uh, in, in the higher, like higher quality as they claim from the latest research. So I think the EU is at war of vaccines in multiple fronts. Uh, at multiple fronts, so not only with, with, with the UK, but I, of course I, I agree with you that I mean this this gives this gives the UK such uh, new advantage uh, during uh, after this Brexit to have you know to have uh, to have the the control control over the production of uh, AstraZeneca and so on. But as I said. The, the EU and, and ASEAN as well is, is at the war of multiple fronts uh, of this vaccine uh, manufacturing uh, and vaccine uh, access. So that, that would be, that would be my, my answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Potrinan. So, uh, okay, we'd like to uh, invite Dr. Kawase well, for his uh, response remark. Okay, so he would rather ask questions first. <laughs> and um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Moshimer and Dr. Pasuridon. Uh, um, I was very um, um, 
uh, amazed um, by uh, your great presentation. So actually, I have um, two uh, questions for uh, each of you. And so uh, <coughs> um, start uh, from the questions to uh, Dr. Moshama. So <coughs> and actually, I am uh, very uh, happy uh, to uh, that I found we uh, share a lot of um, common um, intellectual interest. So, <clears throat> and actually, my first question uh, probably may be a trivial thing uh, for you, but um, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, you used the word such as the uh, uh, false model and true model. So I think the idea of true or false is very important idea in the philosophy. So my question is that, um, do you think we can know or we can recognize uh, whether some models are true or false or right or wrong in advance? So before we uh, take some uh, action uh, in a, a priori way, so in my mind, I have a theory of Karl Popper. Um, according to Fitch, uh, we can make progress only by piecemeal way, so only by trial and error. So um, according to him, uh, according to Karl Popper, we can um, not know um, about everything uh, in the future in advance. So, um, so I want to know uh, your idea about uh, the true or false. So this is my first question. And the second question to you is about the uh, table to compare EU and ASEAN uh, you show. And you listed the word uh, formerly colonized, I think, uh, you, uh, in your uh, table. So how is it? So how is the history of colonization important for the regional integration. So um, please tell me. So this is uh, the two questions to Dr. Moshima. And next, uh, I have two questions to Dr. Uh, Pasoriton. Um, actually, um, thank you very much. So um, uh, I learned a lot of things about uh, history. So actually, um, I think philosopher and uh, some philosopher, including me, always think something very abstract and something very vague. So actually, I am not very sure about the uh, knowledge about uh, history. So uh, please tell me, um, so my uh, question is that, um, is modernization, so making society modern, um, is it advantage or disadvantage uh, for uh, the uh, uh, regional integration. Um, because um, <clears throat> modern age is nationalistic age, in my opinion. We are so deeply rooted in the uh, modernism. We are so deeply in, uh, rooted in the modern way of thinking everything. And we are so deeply rooted in the nationalist idea at the same time. So if we want to achieve regional integration, uh, should we give up the modern way of life or modern way of philosophy, modern way of value? So this is my first question. And the second question uh, to uh, Dr. Pusuritong is my <laughs> very um, personal question. Um, uh, so uh, it is about uh, your gender study. So uh, I am uh, very, very interested in this um, uh, question after my daughter was born. <laughs> uh, so my question is, how is the social uh, situation of the gender gap of the education in Thailand? So in Japan, it is still uh, very bad. Uh, for example, I think um, uh, the female students occupy less than only 30% or uh, about that in our faculty. Or, so um, we have another interesting uh, example of that. So we do not have a female toilet in, our, uh, the, in the floor of the building in, uh, in which my uh, research 
um, room located. So um, this uh, fact shows um, how much male professor dominated in the uh, faculty of um, law, economics, and, uh, and politics in, in Japan. So actually, I am interested in the gender gap of education in Thailand. So um, mm. this is uh, two questions to the uh, Dr. Soriton. And finally, um, the question and answer to Professor Mizushima. And Ah, yes, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. You um, asked the question about the uh, uh, language. Uh, so yes, um, I think so. So many people ask question about language in <laughs> my presentation. So I think this is the bottleneck of my uh, theory. So um, yes, you are uh, right. So. Uh, I think um, the, uh, the number of people who speak English um, as their mother tongue, especially in the continent of Europe, is still very uh, few and actually, um, yes, very few. So this um, <clears throat> part shows um, there are a huge gap between the, uh, the elite who can speak English and the non-elite who cannot speak English in the continent Europe, uh, European country. So I think, um, yes, so, um, yes, I think this is, uh, yes, the reason, um, uh, the, uh, the regional integration uh, or uh, the deficiency of the democracy is very serious in the uh, uh, European Union. So I think this is a very great, uh, so the, a gap between the elite and the non-elite is the great one of the greatest enemy of the integration um, these days. So, and my, actually, I have a question <laughs> to you uh, about the same um, problem. So, uh, about American uh, politics, and my question is that: uh, Was the popularity of Barack Obama populism? So, it means in another way, uh, is populism? necessarily connected with anti-intellectualism. So in the case of Donald Trump, it is connected. Actually, it is true, I think. But um, is it necessarily true? So I think uh, Barack Obama was very uh, popular at that time. And is it, uh, was it populism or not? So this is my question. So thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. So uh, please. Uh, Okay, can you please, uh, Dr. Moshama, first uh, respond to uh, Dr. Kawase's uh, question and comment, please? Okay. Um, the first question uh, referred to something obviously very large and difficult, uh, namely uh, theories of truth and so on. Yes. But, um, but when we, we refer to Popa, right, um, the main idea is, is pretty simple here in the sense, it's, it's a standpoint against Marxist theory that tries to um, predict a class struggle uh, and Hegelian thinking, uh, historical he Hegelian thinking. So that, that is uh, the idea of Bob, of course, to say, wait a minute, uh, we cannot really uh, predict a history as we predict uh, the planetary motions. Uh, and, but actually, I, I did um, I, I did mean that with my presentation, invoking also the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, uh, to say that we have to be very careful in thinking that we understand uh, causality in uh, some contexts and that we can model causality. And um, so actually, I mean, I, I do agree that, that um, we can only make very careful progress in understanding economic reality and how it plays out. And social engineering based on that thinking is maybe dangerous. So the false model I invoked, uh, I meant that too often actually we use maybe false models and portray them as correct and use them to prescribe something or to have a plan how to make society better without fully understanding 
And I actually mentioned gender studies as, an, as a potential example, being a bit of contrarian maybe in this context here, but saying you could maybe by claiming that gender is only socially constructed, maybe that uh, some evolutionary th uh, biologists would say, no, that's, the, that's a big debate nowadays that is so heated in the American context, uh, if you know that. Uh, but um, you could say that's actually wrong. Uh, you could say that the, along the starting position of your social reform is wrong. Genders are actually not socially constructed. That is still a question. And uh, that's what I meant. Sometimes we jump into some models and make big plans for a new society without really thinking what are the underpinnings of our initial assumptions. Uh, so that was a little bit the idea uh, of that point. And the, the second idea, um, the colonialist, col colonialism, I'm really not an expert here, but I just assume if a country was colonized, it holds its nationality very dearly. Oh. That's what I think. There, might, there may be a resistance to the, uh, this, using the nice phrase again, the paradox of, of uh, uh, too much integration, uh, so strong integration, uh, because countries are really maybe a bit um, careful in giving up certain rights that the, the, that had been taken for, away from them before. So in Europe, of course, you had very strong nation states and a lot of wars and animosities, but we had also always uh, transnational powers. The aristocracy was marrying each other, uh, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and the, uh, uh, the old tradition of, of speaking Latin and having Christianity as a common base. So there was always a kind of a transnational also culture. Uh, so I think that in that sense, uh, Europe has actually a better starting point to, for a strong integration. But as we have learned in other fronts, the strong integration leads to a paradox and maybe problems. Um, yeah, okay, that is what I thank wanted you, to thank say. You very thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mosema. Oh, uh, okay, can we also uh, invite uh, Dr. Fosriton for uh, any uh, remarks? Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kawase, for your, for your comments and, and your question. Um, if I may add to uh, Dr. Munchammer the, the answer on decolonization because I'm a historian, so um, <laughs> if I could add a little bit, um, I totally agree with you uh, with your answer, your comments on the, uh, the national sovereignty mm -hmm. of the nations that have been formerly colonized, of course, would have emerged to be uh, more like to have like stronger sense of identity. But on the other hand, I think in the case of ASEAN, if I may speak on, you know, for, for ASEAN, um, in the context of ASEAN, when it was integrating, when, when the regional integration had uh, began, it, we have to also consider that there were various groups of nations, and most of them, of course, were, were under the Western influences, West, Western colonization before. But this is also, uh, I mean, decolonization was uh, in a way determine the, the groups of integra uh, integrated communities that were formed. We have seen in Southeast Asia, uh, before ASEAN was formed uh, in 1950s, the emerging group, for example, the, the, uh, that, that joined with the non-aligned movement, the NAM, um, such as Indonesia, um, Burma also was part of NAM for a certain period. Uh, and then we have seen the more, the so-called more pro-American group, like those who, of course, uh, were part of CETO, um, including Thailand, the Philippines, and so on and so forth. But, but basically, I think, um, so before, like, I think in the 1950s, especially after decolonization has become successful, many countries have gained their uh, identities. It's very much de determined their stance, uh, whether, like, which side they want to go to. And at the end, as in the case of ASEAN, it turns out that if you're not part of CETO, then you are against American, uh, you are against Amer uh, the United States that was the superpower in the area at that time. So the Cold War again play, 
played a role here. Not not only not only decolonization. So I, I guess we we saw multiple groups. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Multiple multiple integrated groups, and eventually those multiple groups joined as one in 1960s as um, as ASEAN. So that would be my my first comment. Um, to to the my presentation. Um, your question is very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, on modernization, if it's, it's seen as the advantage for the integration or disadvantage, right? I think, well, as you are a philosopher, uh, I, think, I think we must ident identify first what is modernization, correct? Ah. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, if, of, of course, I think we, we have the common understanding yeah. of modernization. But um, uh, and your your question that you raise is like, should we give up modernization in order to be more integrated? Um, pers uh, personally, so, yes, yes. Um, sorry, uh, I, I'm sorry for uh, interrupt. So in um, so uh, my theory of liberal nationalism, it, the modernization is the uh, combination of liberalism and nationalism. So. Uh, we uh, respect the uh, the value of freedom and equality and mm. um, uh, the fraternity. So um, such kind of uh, the French Revolution or American mm. uh, Revolution. Uh, so such kind of uh, modern constitution uh, respect uh, respecting the values. So this is the uh, value or way uh, way of thinking of modern society, in my opinion. And um, it was as uh, they were achieved in the framework of nation state in my opinion so the nation state and the value of uh, modern society is uh, combined and is it uh, necessary so this is my question okay thank you very much dr kawase yes i understand now i think this 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 is a very hard hard uh, question as well to think about um definitely there can be it's it's kind of a both i think i will i'll be i'll be balancing between the two mm -hmm. uh, whether it is the disadvantage i think if we use it the wrong way perhaps mm -hmm. if we use it to promote extra extra nationalism like chauvinism then of course it could be the disadvantage but if we use it for the positive contribution, uh, I, I just heard now uh, uh, Dr. Moshammer explain about like how the European states, for example, they, they were stronger nation states before uh, they become integrated or before anyone else in the world. So how, how could they use that as their advantage? Perhaps we should, we should learn from them. I think it's, it's, it's the matter of to what extent do we use it to our, to the national, to the regional benefits, not only to the national benefits? Um, that's, that's what I, I think uh, to, the, to this question. And I hope that answer a, a little bit, um, more or less. Um, so the, th the third one, thank you very much for the, the gender one. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that you are interested in, in my uh, my presentation on on gender. I mean, I didn't really have time to focus so much in detail, but definitely we can continue uh, some other time with that topic. Um, gender setback, uh, gender inequality, I think is an issue worldwide. And um, the reason why I raised the gender inequality issue in this presentation is because I see it as one area that has been maybe underrepresented by uh, by the recent research on effects on impact of COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, as we you know we talk about inequalities, poverty, unemployment, but we don't really talk so much about gender setbacks, which is really impacting. Uh, the society. Uh, I, I came across one of the, the researches that show, uh, that makes me think about how women, uh, girls, are basically the caregivers. Uh, they, they are the one who take care of the family overall. 
um, and how how are they getting access to vaccines? If the uh, once the vaccine became available, uh, do we think about the, the 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 one who give care to everyone in the family first, or we think of men in the family first? Of course, I think in most societies, uh, in Asian societies, uh, where patriarchy patriarchy plays the dominant role, we would think of the the men first. So that's that's more of of the perspective that I try to present, um, but uh, but I, I think and 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 so it brings me to 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 think further that this gender setback, gender inequality is very much related to poverty, to economic status. So um, as of also during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of like the rising unemployment rate. People become unemployed, poverty has gone up uh, so the gender inequality seems to be more and more apparent uh, i'm not speaking of urban areas i believe that maybe we can apply the same theory to japan and east asia as well that in maybe in urban areas things are a bit different but in rural areas especially in in asean countries in southeast asia uh, this is still a very important uh, factor that this is uh, poverty is still a very important important factor to determine the the gender uh, gender status of women uh, in 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 certain areas. Okay. So I, I hope I answer your questions more or less. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So I I know very very serious example in Japan about the gender gap uh, during COVID nineteen. So mm. I had. Uh, uh, the suicide rate of the women uh, rapidly increased after the uh, COVID situation. And actually, I'm not sure about the reason of that, but actually, this is a fact in Japan. Right, right. Yes, wow, yes. thank you very much, Kat. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kawase. So uh, now uh, we would like to again uh, invite uh, Professor Mark. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I got a question from Professor Kawase, uh, and he asked about the relationship between Barack Obama movement and populism, uh, probably because uh, I'm an uh, expert on uh, populism. And, and I uh, agree what you mean, because uh, the style of Obama and uh, Donald Trump, uh, they have the same uh, uh, features, uh, they have much in common. They are so popular, and uh, they are uh, they uh, uh, they speak very uh, directly to the, the common people, and they are quite popular. Uh, but as a political scientist, uh, I can say Obama is a populist uh, because uh, originally populism, originally populism started in United States. Mm -hmm. So their origin, uh, populism, uh, the, the origin of populism is in the United States. In the, the end of 19th century, uh, U.S. farmers and workers, uh, they uh, established the Populist Party, and they, uh, fight, uh, they fought against a big capital and established parties. And their motivation is anti-establishment, mm -hmm. anti elite So if we say about uh, populism in the United States, they are mostly anti elite mm -hmm. uh, And uh, I don't think Obama is an anti elite mm -hmm. mm. So probably Obama is not a populist. But uh, anyway, uh, Obama and Trump, they uh, uh, both use uh, SNS mm -hmm. and internet quite actively. Mm -hmm. And we uh, see many common mm -hmm. uh, features among the two. So it is not a matter of uh, the uh, leader and conservative. No, 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 no. So, so. Oh, populism could be right wing, uh, but it could be left wing. Uh, Donald uh, Trump and uh, Bernie Sanders. So, so it is not the matter of political ideology, but uh, it is the culture of America. Oh, uh, yes. Anti-established. Mm. So, <laughs> right. But anyway, we can <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> right. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for your uh, valuable contributions. Well, actually, okay, time is coming up. Uh, okay. So uh, I'd like to just uh, briefly wrap up today's achievement. Uh, but um, okay, we are a group of uh, philosophers, uh, historian, and uh, economist, po uh, political scientist. <laughs> so it has been a really, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, an interesting uh, mix of our uh, specialization. So, and then the topic was uh, quite wide ranging, but uh, one e common uh, denominator was that you know, uh, okay, regional integration has been a really, uh, uh, I mean, ambitious uh, target, but we are still in the middle. And then lots of you know shakes and you know lots of you know unexpected you know, issues you know including you know COVID nineteen you know are actually uh, coming up. So who knows you know what comes next? Okay, you know after uh, Trump and after you know this COVID and after Brexit and after etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we uh, have no way of you know I mean uh, singly identifying the you know. Uh, common, you know, integrating factor or you know disintegrating factor, but uh, e uh, maybe uh, we can at least say that you know uh, regional integration is a really multifaceted phenomena, really multifaceted. So uh, ASEAN has this you know, unity in diversity concept uh, together with uh, maybe uh, EU, but uh, I guess uh, unities in diversities <laughs> that's the reality. So I don't know if unities, uh, uh, you know, as, as a plural uh, form, is actually a unity or not. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, because uh, you know, regional integration is a really multifaceted uh, issue, it's you know difficult and even impossible to to try to you know unify you know this you know community. <laughs> Because you know, we have various layers. You know, I'm an economist, so I'm uh, basically interested in you know exporting and importing. You know, free tariff uh, zone, single market. So it's uh, you know the you know basic you know the, the functioning of you know our economic society. So as Karl Marx mentioned, okay, this could be uh, one of the starting points of our you know social changes. But uh, at the same time, we have you know this emerging society. Like, uh, okay, I'm, uh, I'm from Europe, okay? I don't say I'm from Germany, but I'm from uh, Europe. I'm a European citizen, so that could be possible. I don't know much about, uh, you know, whether an I mean, average, uh, you know, um, EU citizen would say, okay, I'm from ASEAN, or <laughs> I'm an ASEAN citizen. I, I don't think that much, so, but, uh, you know, but anyway, you know, people still have some kind of a vague concept up in the air about, you know, their emerging community toward which our economic and political institutional efforts will gravitate. So, uh, you know, we have lots of, you know, economic, you know, you know identity level, uh, policy level, and then emerging, you know, emotional community level even. You know, so we have, you know, these, you know, multiple, you know, uh, you know, uh, fast, I mean, uh, aspects about, you know, regional integration process. So unities in diversities, I don't know if that's really, I mean, uh, equivalent to unity, uh, real sense of unity, but uh, ah, that's what I have been feeling. Okay, so, uh, you know, there is no, uh, you know, way of, you know, unifying today's discussion, <laughs> obviously, but uh, Luckily, luckily, uh, we're going to have another chance, yes, because our uh, research uh, undertaking will continue on to the next academic year. Uh, so if possible, we'd like to invite uh, both of you again, because uh, based on today's, uh, uh, I mean, recordings of what you have mentioned, we're going to be preparing some kind of a, a transcript in a written format, but it's still in the middle. Because uh, we have expressed our things and then some kind of a convergence, but still more of a, I mean, diverse, I mean, diversified, you know, topics. So uh, we need maybe one more uh, session to think about, you know, what we have discussed today based on the, the transcript that we are going to be uh, preparing. Okay, hopefully within the next couple of months. And then uh, I like to you know, just circulate that, that transcript and then think about uh, what we can 
<laughs> agree, on, agree upon academically speaking. We're not going to I mean, uh, I do anything uh, you know, against the European, <laughs> against COVID, anything. Just an academic exercise, I mean, research effort. And then let's see how it will go. So that's uh, I, what I'd like to mention uh, at this point in time. So we are still half uh, way, okay, in the, just in the middle of uh, this you know, research effort. So can you please uh, provide some more input in the near future once again? Would that be all right? Okay, okay. <laughs> what do you think? Okay, so just a, a brief remark from both of you, please. So, so what, what kind of input again could you? Right, right, right. So, uh, actually, uh, we'll be preparing a transcript of today's uh, recording. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we'd like to circulate it. Then, uh, based on today's uh, transcript, maybe our uh, second research meeting. Uh, sometime in uh, summer time or in the autumn time in 2021 we're going to have another session based on today's uh, transcript the okay. recordings but uh, of course uh, we have covered various topics so various various uh, topics uh, some kind of uh, i mean uh, some kind of, of uh, i mean meaningful, uh, meaningful agenda could be agenda. you know more clearly defined next time so if you could just collaborate with uh, with us in terms of you know identify the you know several uh, important uh, you know agendas discussion yeah. point for our second uh, uh, research meeting oh, sure. if possible that's what i really wanted to ask you would that be all right <laughs> yes 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 would be my pleasure yes. thank you thank you very much okay so uh, thank you very much. Okay, time is now up. So we'd like to close this session. Well, once again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Moshiyama, Dr. Triton, for your uh, precious time you have shared with us. Because I know that you know you have to always run around and then give lectures and then you know supervise your students, etc. I know it. So thank you so much for your uh, valuable. Thank you for having us. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes. Thank, thank you, you for your take. So let us stay in touch because we have, you know, this, you know, you know, uh, institutional, you know, exchange agreement between Makidon yeah. University, International College, and Chiba University. So our uh, collaboration, uh, you know, continues definitely. Thank you very yes. much. Is that be all right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to stay in touch. Uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> via email and then also again uh, on uh, Zoom, sometime in the cool. near future. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you much. so much for your time today. Yeah. Okay. Hope to see you soon. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh,